Hello ladies and gentlemen, a very, very warm welcome to the pod reveal of Delft Hyperloop. We are here in our workspace where we have produced, assembled and tested the majority of our prototype for this year. And we have been working here with the team day in, day out to get the system done in time, of course, and also meet the deadlines of the European Hyperloop Week for this year. And as this is where the magic happens, we thought we might as well show you around and give you a tour of each subsystem and each category we compete in in the European Hyperloop Week. My name is Peter Becking. I'm the team captain of Delft Hyperloop for this year. And together with Maxime, I will be your host of today. Thank you, Pete. My name is Maxime Isrif, and I am responsible for this year's public relations. We are very excited to finally show you what we have been working on for an entire year. Today is the day that we will, for the first time, show our pod in operation and introduce you to all our chiefs. Each chief will briefly explain his or her subsystem and tell you how they have experienced this past year. The engineering department um, will tell about their subsystem and the scalability department will tell about the interior and station design as well as the full-scale research. We encourage you to write down your questions because at the end of this live stream we will have a Q&A. We are a team of 35 TU Delft students with extreme affinity for the Hyperloop concept. Our goal for this year was to build a scalable Hyperloop and to research all everything that comes with the implementation of it. The team consists out of several departments and each department has its, has its own goals, its own tasks and its own responsibilities. But besides that, that you work with your own department, we also work with the whole team as one whole. So everyone learns from everyone in the team. And it's so cool to see every day. Last time we saw each other was at the design reveal, where we showed you our design for the system and our goals for this year in full detail. Today we will show you how we realized that design and actually how we kind of completed that goals that we set for ourselves. And also uh, we're going to discuss all the setbacks that every department has had this year and also the successes, of course, that we, uh, yeah, that we came across for this year. And we want to show you today that we live up to what we've promised and also a very important thing, we want to show you how your support has helped us during this whole adventure. We are extremely proud and very excited to be participating in the European Hyperloop Week in Valencia this year. Tomorrow the truck will arrive and we will start loading in our stuff. And there's only one week left until the first people are already heading there for preparations. We will be competing in five out of six awards and we plan on bringing home all of them. We as a team are ready and today we will show you how we do that. Let's start with our first and foremost chief engineer, Gijs van Veen. Hi Gijs. Of course, we've met thousands of times in this area, but today is the first time we have a lot of audience, right? Yeah, since the design review, we have been working day and night on realizing the design we have made. And I think we are all very pleased to show the audience what we have accomplished until now. That's so cool. Can you maybe give everyone watching at home a small recap of our design philosophy? Oh yeah, our design philosophy. Our design philosophy is uh, captured in the golden triangle. And the three main pillars of those triangle are reliability, sustainability, and energy efficiency. And you can see those coming back in our design. For example, our braking system and onboard control system work together to reliably stop the pod no matter what the circumstances are. And our aeroshell is 3D printed from a recyclable material, making it very sustainable. And the energy efficiency you can see coming back with our motor choice, which Martijn will tell you a lot more about tonight. That's so great. And this all comes together as a scalable, scalable hyperloop. hyperloop. Right? Yes, exactly. Right, that's the whole goal. And then, Gijs, how is the system built up? Can you maybe explain because it's very complex, of course? Well, as you can see, uh, this is a render of the system uh, with an exploded view. And it's very complex, so that's why uh, we divided the system up in five different subsystems, which are represented by the uh, departments. Uh, we have the propulsion, structures, uh, braking, suspension, and sensor control department. And I think they're all very eager to tell you tonight what they have done. Yeah, I think so as well. Let's head to the first one, Maxime. You'll end the first one, yeah. 
Yes, I am here with Martijn, who is yes. responsible for our propulsion system. We've been promoting the LSM very extensively online because we feel like this is the way we will win the AGW. How does it work? Yeah, so the propulsion system is there to uh, propel the pot forwards, uh, make it accelerate and stop just in time before the braking system initiates. So it consists of a moving part and a stationary part. Mm -hmm. And it's actually called a linear synchronous motor which means it is, instead of a rotary electric motor, it's linear, so it's rolled out onto the entire track. Um, yeah, so let me show you the first part. So this is actually in the track. Uh, it consists of coils, so these coils are powered and they provide a magnetic field. And this magnetic field is actually uh, exactly synchronous uh, with the magnet yoke. And the magnet yoke is on the pod. And uh, yeah, should we yeah. walk over there to see it? Yeah, let's do that. So, these black things you see are, are the, is what you just showed us, right? These are the coils. Yeah, so inside here are actually the coils. You can't see them anymore because it's covered in black epoxy. Uh, and just down here, on the underside of the pot is the magnet yoke. Mm -hmm. uh, the magnets, you can't actually see them because there's a thick layer of iron at the back of it. And this not only keeps the magnetic field inside of the magnet yoke, but it also makes it stronger for more force uh, into the system. Okay, and as I said before, we've been promoting it very much. So why are we so proud of this? Uh, why was this such a challenge? Yeah, it was a huge challenge because the propulsion department didn't actually even know what an LSM was when we started. Uh, but yeah, with much help of our partners, with their facilities, resources, materials, but also with uh, much work from ourselves, we were able to pull this off in yeah, such a short amount of time, which is, was really great. In the and end. it was something completely new, so why go through all that trouble? Why do we think the LSM was the right way to go? Yeah, well, of course, we looked for that at the Golden Triangle Gijs just uh, told you about. So we looked at efficiency, so for instance, this LSM is a contactless system. So it can achieve really high velocities without any friction, uh, which makes it also very sustainable, another one of the pillars. And also it's a very reliable, reliable system. Uh, it's already used in many applications, uh, for instance, maglev trains in China, which can travel at 400 kilometers an hour uh, in air. So yeah, even putting it in vacuum is much better, of course. Uh, and also, yeah, for our, our system, we made it reliable by testing it a lot. So doing different sub-tests, testing it in vacuum, but also uh, other tests with the magnet yoke, and then lots of runs mm -hmm. to see what the performance was. Okay, and we're actually bringing this 30 meter long track with us to Valencia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we are. That's so cool. Yeah, it is. <laughs> okay, then we'll go back to Peter, who is uh, waiting with Willem over there from Structures. Yes. Thank you, Maxime. Uh, I'm here with Willem, Chief, Chief Structures. Uh, Willem, can you tell us what exactly, what parts of the system are included in the Structures Department? Okay, yeah, Peter. Uh, so the st uh, Structure Department consists actually of two main components. We have the chassis and the aerodynamic shell. Uh, the chassis is the main element that connects all the subsystems, as you can see on the, on the picture. Uh, its primary function is to absorb all the loads that are executed on it during a run and uh, transferring those loads to places in the chassis where equilibrium can be reached. The aerodynamic shell reduces the total drag over the path to increase its performances like maximum velocity. It's also a protective case around the path to protect the, all the subsystems for any debris that can be on the track during a run. That's so cool. And about the chassis, uh, how did you know while designing the chassis, how did you know that it could withstand all forces executed on it during a pod run, for example? Yeah, so during our design phase, we spent a lot of time doing FAM analysis. Uh, FAM stands for finite element method. Uh, it's a mathematical simulation technique that offers us an opportunity to simulate the loads on the chassis in a computer program. And with the FAM analysis, we could reduce the need for physical prototyping uh, a lot and also doing further tasks to uh, optimize our design and prove its strength. That's so cool. And 
What was your biggest challenge this year? So our biggest challenge this year was for sure the production of the aerosol. Uh, the goal uh, for the aerosol was to be cost efficient and sustainable and therefore scalable. Um, to reach this goal, uh, we used the innovative technique of 3D printing. As you can see here, uh, this is a part of the shell that has been 3D printed. Uh, after the 3D printing, it's been laminated with carbon fiber to strengthen it. Uh, now, this was never seen in the industry before, so um, it was a big uh, risk for us, but we took it, we take matter in our own hands, uh, and I think uh, we succeeded in that. That's so cool. How did you know you succeeded? How did you succeed? So yeah, we succeeded by uh, working closely together with our partners to um, get their knowledge on, in, from the different kind of sectors, uh, combine those knowledges to make different approaches of pro, uh, pr uh, production approaches mm -hmm. and material selections. And after thoroughly testing all these approaches and materials, we came, uh, it took a lot of effort and we came with an amazing 3D printed, reinforced with carbon fiber uh, shell as we know it today. And we're very proud of that. That's very exciting. And we're going to see it run later today as well. So cool. Thank you, Thank you Willem. Uh, next up, Maxime is breaking. Yes, I'm here with Bas, and you are responsible for making the pod eventually come to a standstill. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what are you true. holding over here? Well, these are the calibers of the braking system. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very important for the braking system to be reliable. Mm -hmm. And we achieved that by making it feel safe and redundant. And that means that even in case of a loss of power, mm -hmm. we can still break the pot. Um, and it's a hydraulic braking system. Uh, so what you see here are the calipers. And it, oil will flow through these tubes under pressure. Mm -hmm. And inside the calipers are brake pads. And when the oil flows through the tubes, the brake pads will uh, come into contact with the track. Hmm. And I can show you on the pot yeah, how it uh, looks like. I think like. that's a good one. So um, you can see what I was holding. You can see it here on the pot. And it's actually on both sides of the pot. Mm -hmm. um, and it will basically clamp on the track. And the friction will um, yeah, slow down the, the pot. But everything on top here is also part of the braking system, yeah, right? Yeah, that provides the pressure. Okay. And um, were you nervous for the first, for the first pod run? I can imagine yeah. if it doesn't stop, then... Yes, of course we were nervous for that. But um, we tested it first on the flywheel. And the flywheel is basically a big wheel, which mm -hmm. we can rotate uh, to speeds up to 600 kilometers an hour. And um, when we succeeded on the flywheel, uh, we started doing push tests. And that was basically just pushing the pod along the track and activating the braking system. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also tested the, the safety measures. So if we had a power loss, what would happen? And if we had a loss of uh, communication? And yeah, that all turned out well. So mm -hmm. then we were confident enough to do a full pod test with propulsion. OK, and what would you think that was your biggest challenge this year then? Um, well, I think that filling the system was one of our biggest challenges because one of the advantages of a hydraulic system is that the oil is incompressible mm -hmm. and air is not. So if you have air bubbles inside of the system, the oil will first compress the air and then move the oil uh, to, to um, move the brake pads to the track. So you lose a lot of performance if there is air in the system and we had to get it out. So yeah, that was one of our biggest But you struggles. did, Yeah, eventually. we did, yeah, with the help of our partners. Um, we managed to, uh, to do it. That's awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're moving to uh, suspension. Yes, thank you, Maxime and Bas. I'm here with Tom, Chief Suspension. Tom, can you tell us yeah, what, what, what are the tasks of the suspension department? Yes, so the main objective of suspension is to keep the pot on the track. As Martijn told you, for the LSM, it's crucial that the lateral air gap between the magnet yoke and the co coils is kept as constant as possible for a propulsive efficiency, which is one of the three pillars of our design philosophy. So, uh, also, limiting lateral movement is also beneficial for our braking system because uh, a smaller distance between the brake pads and the track gives us a higher performance which is also safer. Furthermore, to tackle this issue, we developed the lateral guidance subsystem, 
And this is placed on the four corners of our pod. And uh, it clamps the pod to the track. And we do this with uh, the adjustable bracket. It works like this. If we rotate this bolt, we compress the shock damper. And this gives a force which is exhibited onto the track, which clamps the pod to the track. And this limits lateral movement. All right. And to keep the pod upright during braking, accelerating, and to carry the weight of the pod to the ground, we develop the vertical guidance subsystem. Now, for both systems, we also develop two wheels. So the wheels for lateral have bearings inside of them, and the wheels for vertical have bearings on the outside, so that the axle rotates along, which is good for, for velocity measurements. Yeah, okay, that's so cool. And uh, also, Tom, because I can imagine it's really crucial, it's a crucial part of the pot, as you said, of course. Yeah. Uh, how did you know for sure that it was gonna work on the pot before you actually put it on the pot? Yes, so we mounted a part of the chassis with the suspension systems onto the flywheel setup and tested it up to 200 kilometers an hour. And to really, really test the limits, we added a small bump into the flywheel of a millimeter to see the effects of uh, irregularity in the track. Okay, that's so cool. And yeah. did it work? It worked perfectly. That's great. So now it's really mounted on the pod and ready to be work, working in a, in a pod run as well. That's exactly. So cool. yeah. hey, Tom, what was your department's biggest challenge for this year? Yeah, our biggest challenge has to do with the time we had this year. So we had to find a shock damper before we had finalized our design and done our vehicle dynamics calculations. So to tackle this, we went with the very versatile and highly tunable shock damper. And you can change the stiffness with it by adjusting the internal air pressure and the damping response by turning this dial. So we tested it extensively and basically built the whole system of suspension around the shock damper and we made it work. That's so great. Cool. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. Okay, next up, Maxime, is sense and control. Yes, thank you, Peter. Um, I'm here with Niels. Sense and control is quite a vague concept. Could you explain to us what it is? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've heard it before. <laughs> um, yeah, so sensor control works basically on all the electronics in the system that is not the propulsion. Um, so we work on all the sensors on the pod and on the track. Uh, we provide power on the pod. We, do, we determine the location of the pod, which is an important parameter to drive the motor. Um, we also do the software and wireless communication to communicate between pod and track. And um, basically data is gathered from all around the system and it's processed in such a way that uh, the system knows how to respond on each situation. Okay, and I see you're working on a PCB. That's one of the most important parts of sense and control, right? Yeah, it is. It's, uh, you can basically see it as a brain of our system. Mm -hmm. um, so it may seem quite complex and, and quite daunting to a lot of people. Um, and we make this completely ourselves. But the thing is, when you break it down in schematics and smaller uh, uh, sections of it, mm -hmm. it, it's not as complex as it would seem at the first <laughs> place. So the, we did not have a whole lot of experience in you designing these things. No, we did not. <laughs> um, but the thing is, we were a group of super motivated people and eager to learn. So we, we got the hang of it in no time, designing the PCBs. And it's also uh, on the pod right now. Uh, could it you is. show it to us? Yeah, let's take a look. Hi, Niels. Good to see you here as well. Let's show the audience what it looks like on the pod as well. Yes, but before we take a look at the pod, uh, a very important part of what we do is at the end of the track, uh, which is the ground control station. Uh, and over there, the computer um, controls the linear motor that's inside of the track. Uh, and the ground control station communicates with the pod to know where it is and the data from the sensors. Uh, and that's done through wireless communication. Uh, and the wireless communication is done through this component over here. Um, if we take a look at the other side of the pod, that's this side, we can see the newer version of the PCB I just showed at the table, uh, which is kind of the heart and brain of the whole pod. Uh, and you can see all the wires and the connectors coming in. And that's where the processing is happening, where data is coming in and action is performed, basically. 
Right. Um, yeah, to power the whole pod, we have produced our own lithium iron battery pack. And this pack contains all the safety features we need to operate the pod and the track safely. For the people at home, it's now on the screen, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, you can see on the, the left, you can well. see the battery pack yeah. and the individual battery cells that are inside. Okay. So on the right uh, of, the, of the image, we see the power distribution board. And the power distribution board on the pod makes sure that the right voltage sources are provided for each component that is on the pod. Um, but not all our work can be found in the pod, actually. There's also stuff on the track that we've done. So let me grab one. So over here, I've got what we call the hall sensor unit. And these two hall sensors uh, sense magnetic field. Uh, on the pod, we have placed a magnet strip, and these sensors sense the magnets of the pod. So when the pod moves past these units, and these units are placed on every meter on our track, it knows where the pod is, because it senses the magnets on the pod. Um, and these units are a cheap and scalable option so it could be placed on longer tracks um, as a good solution. That's great for the future Hyperloop implementation as well. Exactly. That's great. Niels, what has been your department's biggest challenge for, yeah, for this year? Our biggest challenge was definitely these little guys. Yeah. These units uh, did cause us quite a bit of trouble. Um, we chose to not buy a sensor off the shelf. We chose to design everything ourselves from scratch. Um, and that took quite a bit of time. And we had some bumps to, uh, to overcome, basically. Um, but the thing is that the alumni of Delft Hyperloop, as well as our partners, were all super motivated and eager to help us with these problems. And they helped us overcome these problems. And you succeeded. That's so Definitely. cool. That's so cool. Thank you, Niels. I'm sure everyone watching is really intrigued by your story as well. Thank you so much. Next up is Nina who is responsible for the team building and team spirit in our team. Take the floor, Nien. Hi, thank you. My name is Nina, and I've been responsible for the motivation of our team members. During the year, I tried to make sure that everyone was enjoying their tasks and felt comfortable within our team. I always thought it was super important that everyone in our team knew that all the effort that they made was being valued by all of us and that their contribution was being appreciated. I also tried to connect our team members on a personal level by arranging activities that we do during the work, but also outside of work. And I think that this team atmosphere that we created with that has been one of the key elements for us being able to show you our system today. Now, in the first half year during the design phase, everyone had a very straightforward task and it was very outlined and specific. What I really liked during production and from production onwards was that it became a bit more vague and as everyone could see what we were actually making because it was becoming tangible, everyone could see the bigger picture and not just the small parts that they had been working on. And this way people could help each other way better and they could take up tasks that they didn't thought were for them initially. So even now, with only a few days before the truck is leaving, Boss and Willem, for example, are building transport boxes for the systems of others. And Niels just fixed the lights of the, the uh, full-scale model yesterday. Right now, you can see that Gijs is preparing the track because we want to demonstrate in a, li in a little bit to you what we have made. And you can see the red lights indicating that there's high voltage on the track right now. But before we do, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I thought were the most special moments during the year. And I thought the most special weeks were the weeks right before we had to hand in our last deliverable for the European Hyperloop Week. The testing and safety documentation and all the research. Because in those weeks, still so much needed to happen, we were not nearly finished. And everyone was super stressed. But 
even though there was so much stress, it was also so hilarious to see everyone here in this workspace. And they were with energy drinks and the music was blasting as loud as possible through all the speakers because everyone wanted to finish in time. And when we had performed all those tests, we still needed to document it. We had just a matter of two to three days and we made documents of over 1500 pages because all those people were doing the exact same thing with just one goal. I thought that was super cool to see. And I don't know exactly how to express this whole year as an experience to you, but if I would compare it to something that is a bit more generally known by everyone, I think I would compare it to a school camp. Because during a school camp, you're also with exact same people every single day. You're in this bubble. There is a sense of community. You become friends with people that you might not have become friends with in your normal, in your normal life. In a school camp, you also have barely any sleep. You drink a lot of energy drinks. But most of all, you just have a lot of fun. And that's what we had as well. We had a lot of fun. We have seen each other in all sorts of states, from being extremely happy to being absolutely miserable. But I think today, everyone can just be super proud of what we have built together. And I think we're all extremely excited to show you. I think we're almost ready, but before we're going to show you, it might be fun for you to know that right after this final run, it will be the last run for the Bolt and Delft this year, we have to pack everything because after this weekend, the whole truck is leaving for Valencia. So I think we're going to have a rather busy weekend, aren't we, Pete? Yeah, it's going to take some, some last long nights without sleep and a lot yeah. of energy drinks then as well. Yeah. I think so too, but we better enjoy it because afterwards, it will be over. That's true. So, let's, uh, what do we say? I think the track is ready because the lights are on, so the high voltage is on it. Gijs, is the pot ready as well? Because then I would like to ask the team to gather around. And yes, yeah, we have show to everything. we built uh, for this year. So, Floor, when you are ready, you can start the countdown. What a beauty, what a beauty. <laughs> I've seen this pod doing this run countless times and at way higher speeds as well. And I can definitely say that it still looks amazing to me. Like Nina said, our engineers worked countless hours and so many nights to get to this point. But I think as a team, we can all agree on one thing. And that is that without our partners, none of this would have been possible. Like you can see, the pod is standing here now. And uh, yeah, we are just immensely proud to where we've come. And yeah, as, as on behalf of Delft Hyperloop 5, I would like to formally thank you for all of your support this year. We're going to Valencia. And we really hope that we can maintain a great relationship for the future Delft Type Loop journeys. Thank you. I'm here uh, with Puck and Annemiek. We're going to talk about something different now because you are part of the scalability department, right? Yeah, you're right. I'm the lead of the scalability department, uh, so I can tell you all about it. Uh, the scalability department is a little bit different from uh, our other departments because we are the only department that doesn't work on the prototype of the Hyperloop pod that you just saw for the first time. Uh, instead, we work on the Hyperloop concept in the bigger picture. So what it will look like when it's implemented in the future for passengers. Our department consists of researchers and designers. So designers are in charge of creating the vision of Delft Hyperloop of the future and creating materials to present those to the outside world. Uh, and then we have our researchers who tackle the big questions regarding this full-scale Hyperloop. For example, about the full-scale technology, but also about uh, the technology uh, in the track, as well as uh, 
yeah. safety yeah. and efficiency, those types of things. And that's why Annemiek is here today. Yeah, because Annemiek you... can tell you all about that. You're part of the full skill department. Yes, I am. But what, uh, what were some of the topics that you researched? Um, yeah, it's good that you asked. Yeah, our first instinct was to do research on every aspect of the system. Uh, but very soon we realized that was not realistic in the amount of time we had. So we had to narrow it down and narrow it down, and we came to three main topics. Uh, the first one was the tube geometry, where we looked at the vertical position of the, of the Hyperloop tubes, either above ground, underground, or on the surface. Uh, the second one was the station security. And thirdly, we looked at the airlock system, which enables passengers to embark and disembark the pods. And the nice thing about all this research uh, is that we could use it in our station design, uh, made by the design department, but we can tell you way more about that than I can. Yeah, because the station design. <laughs> yeah, as you can see uh, in the images, uh, we designed a station uh, to show people what the Hyperloop experience will be like for them uh, in the future. So we designed it not only to look good, but also to actually make sense. So we considered the flow of the uh, pods, of the vehicles, as well as the passengers. We made sure that the platforms make sense, that the structure of the building makes sense, and that it's connected well to uh, existing other uh, transport modes. And then finally, we also considered the airlocks, like Miek uh, mentioned, and the security, because it's important that it's actually a secure system. Uh, as you can see here, but again, me can tell you all about that system because she was in the research team for it. Yeah, because as you can imagine, if you can go from Amsterdam to Paris in 30 minutes, it would be such a waste of time to spend an hour at the station for security procedures. So what we wanted to, the problem we wanted to tackle is how can we efficiently create a security procedure um, so that, well, the 30 minutes would not be the well, one third of your whole journey. So here you can see uh, how we imagine the future of screen screening procedures in this uh, image uh, would look like. And what were the other challenges that you encountered in your research? Uh, that's a good question. So I think our biggest challenge was that there was not a lot of information to find on the, on the system as it does not exist yet. Uh, so in the beginning we were struggling a lot by finding the right sources and also which methods we should adopt. So luckily we had a lot of partners that could help us with finding the right information and also how to use that information. And they also reviewed our research results so that we could finalize a report which we are really, really happy with and very proud of. So you did all this research and Puck implemented it into the station design, but what other materials did you use to present the Delft Hyperloop vision? Yeah, so earlier you saw some pictures from some renderings that we made of uh, the station that we designed. Besides the station, we also designed uh, the interior of uh, the Hyperloop passenger pod, as you can see in this picture. Um, we designed the interior to be light and happy, feel spacious, even though the space is very limited. Um, and we try to make the renderings as realistic as possible so people can really feel that they might be there. Besides that, um, for the station, besides the renders, we also work on a physical scale model, which you can see here. We're still finalizing this, so we're working very close to the deadline, but that's the way it goes in this team. Uh, but we hope to use this to really present uh, our vision, Delft Hyperloop's vision of the future and make people understand uh, and love it as much as we do. So we're bringing not only the renders but also the skill model to the AGW, right? Yeah, we're definitely bringing the skill model to the AGW as well. That's really cool. Thank you so much, Puck. Uh, I think we'll now have a short Q&A, uh, which Peter will tell you more about. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we've come to the end of the tour through the workspace, uh, but don't tune out just yet. We have a little surprise for you at the, uh, at the last moment of this, uh, yeah, of this, of this event. <laughs> uh, but for now, we're going to take around five minutes for the partners to, answer, to ask some questions, and we will answer them accordingly, uh, if necessary, with help of our engineers, of course. Uh, so if I'm correct, you're now able to unmute yourself, and then we should be seeing you on the screen. I'm not sure if the technique is ready. Hi, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Hi, Olivier. Hi. 
First of all, of all uh, I'm truly impressed by uh, the progress your team made. It's, it's very cool to see uh, how much work you put into it and, uh, and what the results are. I'm truly impressed with that. And after the results of the Dutch team at the European Football Championship, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to the success of another Dutch team in the European competition uh, in a few weeks. Um, what I'm curious about is that the uh, European Hyperloop Week uh, concerns several cate categories. And I was wondering um, what are the categories we should uh, look out for? When, where are you, are you going to truly uh, exceed and succeed? Yeah, we're participating in five out of six uh, awards. And I think our plan is obviously to exceed, excel in all of them. But we're uh, competing in uh, the Mechanical Subsystem Award, the, uh, the Electrical Subsystem Award, the Complete Pod Award, the Full Scale Award, and I'm missing one last, which is... The Mechanical Subsystem Award? I already have. Propulsion oh, the Propulsion System, System Award, of course. The Propulsion yeah. System Award. And I think with LSM, um, which is like something no other team is doing, um, we plan on excelling in that one in particular. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, all five, we're going to try to win them. But I think also, uh, as we have this new Propulsion System, then you should definitely uh, watch the Propulsion Subsystem Award. But I think the two big awards in the, uh, in the whole competition will be the Full Scale Award and the Complete Pod Award, as, this, as those are like the whole system combined uh, and, and yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people working on it. So I think that would be the most yeah, intriguing and most fun yeah. competition to watch as well. Yeah, and the Full Scale Award is something that's new this year. So that's also why our scalability department has such a present role as well this year. We're very excited yeah. to show uh, that as well. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm Amelie. Hey, do you hear me? Yeah, we can yeah, hear yeah, you. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, super. So, Amelie, I'm from Turkuil, Belgium here. Well, let me first congratulate you all with your incredibly innovating and groundbreaking work on the Delft Hyperloop pod and also the full scale model. And let me say that we at Turkuil feel that you are contributing a lot to the mobility of the future, of our future. And we believe that your work will be a foundational and necessary step in building a sustainable future. So well done, guys and girls. Thank you so and much. And now my question. <laughs> <laughs> I know that teamwork is very important with you guys, as Nina explained us. And yes, you should be super proud. Uh, how did that go this year, considering the corona situation? Well, that was, of course, not easy. Maybe we can ask Nina if Nina's around still, to maybe elaborate a bit more on that subject. It's Hi, thank you. I heard the lovely compliment, but I didn't quite get your question. What was that exactly? So I know that teamwork is very important to you guys, as you explained us, and you should be super proud on that. Uh, but how did that go this year, considering the corona situation? But because it must have been very challenging. Yeah, that was challenging. Um, I think definitely in the beginning of the year, that was extra challenging. We had to work a lot online and we um, inserted a lot of fun things to do um, because all the people, like all the team members were at home. We had like funny breaks that we would play games and that kind of stuff. Um, so that was definitely at the beginning. And I think the games all made it a bit more fun and easy to still work very hard. And then as the year moved forward, a lot needed to happen physically as we were building the system. So um, we made sure that only a few people would be at the same place at uh, one time and then they could work at the prototype and then people would come in shifts and um, well, with one and a half meter, people could interact with each other. And now we are very happy that it's becoming, well, it's become, um, easy to interact with everyone at the same time. And I'm really happy that we can finally be with the whole team. Does that answer your question? Totally. Thank you, Nina. <laughs> OK, thank you so uh, much for your is question. Um, is there anyone else that wants to? Yeah. Yeah, this is Hi. John Prince. I have a question, too. Can I answer the question? Yeah, 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 yeah go sure, ahead. go ahead. <laughs> hey, thank you very much. Um, the question I have is that the original Hyperloop uh, concept drafted by Elon Musk was based on a vacuum tube. Uh, I don't see this anywhere in your plan. So I wonder if you have any ideas on the vacuum 
system too? Or do you think that maybe this could also work in real time or in reality without the vacuum? No, we uh, definitely think the vacuum tube is, tube is a crucial part of the Hyperloop concept. Definitely. Of course, we are, as I said, we try to make the system in line with the future Hyperloop. And uh, we really try to, yeah, uh, cover all the techniques used in the future Hyperloop. And we do that step by step. So this year, our biggest step was the propulsion, award, uh, the propulsion system, but also everything around it. Uh, and we have not come to the step yet of building a vacuum tube, but we're definitely planning on doing that in the future. What we do, though, is uh, in our full-scale research and our design, as you just saw on the PowerPoints, is that uh, we do account for a uh, vacuum tube around the whole track, of course. Yeah. But, but my question is, would the system work without the tube? Because what I well, see It would now, work, I but it would work in real time. Yeah, it would work, definitely. Uh, but uh, yeah, because of the uh, near vacuum, there is uh, almost no air particles inside the tube. So there's yeah. a lot less resistance. Uh, so if you yeah. remove the tube and there's no vacuum, then uh, yeah, your speeds are getting lower, your efficiency are getting lower. And yeah, that's the whole, yeah, the point of the tube is to, to make it as efficient and top speed as possible, highest top speed. So it's an essential part of the concept. We do think it's an essential part of the concept and we're trying to get there, but yeah, as I said, step by step, coming to the real Hyperloop as it will be in the future. Okay. Thank you, guys. Great Thank you so work. much. Yeah. Is there another question? If not, then we'll, uh, I think we'll round up uh, yeah. to the end. You had a little surprise for us. I did have a little <laughs> surprise, uh, together with the whole team, not just my surprise, of course. But uh, yeah, we've shown you our prototype uh, as it is there. We've shown you our research, our design. And now we would uh, yeah, have a last note about yeah, our, our vision for the future Hyperloop. Uh, a very crucial part of that is that it's, it, the pods are able to move both ways. Uh, because then it wouldn't have to rotate, rotate inside the station, which is nearly impossible. So what we, we have designed for is that the aero shell is symmetrical and that the pod also can move the other way. So that is our little surprise. And I think, Gijs, if you're ready to show that to the world, yes. I think, if I'm correct, we're the only team in the European Hyperloop Week competition being able to do so. So that's really impressive. Sure. Are we ready, Gijs? You can start the countdown. It is back at its base, ready to be packed up and shipped to Valencia in a couple of days. Yeah, thank you so much for watching. We as a team are ready to take on all the other teams at the EHW. You can closely follow our journey on our social media accounts as we will be posting very extensively on there as well. Um, see you in Valencia. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>